certainly a pleasure to be here. Uh, since coming to Atlanta over 25 years ago, I've actually seen the transformation here at Tech Square. My office has always been, I'd say, a couple blocks away, and uh, I think this is really a truly amazing time, which was part of my motivation to come share today. When they approached me, I was like, okay, why do you do this? I do it mainly because I think the energy here in the area is so high that everything that we do and contribute to one another and share is going to build upon it. And I really believe that. So let me give you a little bit of background on, on the, the foundry and kind of how it was created and why it was created. And then I'll get into some of the gory details and the stuff that you'll want to actually work with. About six, seven years ago, some of the officers in our company got together and said, our rate of change in the industry is moving much faster than <laughs> traditional R&D. I mean, many of you may have heard of Bell Labs and the research groups that we've had and so forth. Well, they worked at a very different pace, much more collegial, much more introspective. And then as obviously they came up with things that were very interesting that were brought forth to the company. That's a very different linkage than being with the movement of the business day to day. And if I had to describe where the foundry is today and its evolution is really with the business day to day. We're not, even though we may have separate offices from everybody, I know how the P&Ls are going on the different parts of the company. I know contractually where we're headed. I know where the gaps are that we'd like to fill, which may be a very, very different relationship with the rest of the company. That hasn't happened overnight, as you might imagine. As we joke, we're the, the very small trying to take on the very large. We have 280,000 employees. We've grown from three foundries to six. So that growth curve, even for a business, would be pretty good in five years, right? Doubled our size. We've also probably doubled our scope. And I'll get into a few things in some of the examples, <clears throat> kind of how we got about it. But I think that there's three fundamental pieces for success that I don't care where you are, what you're doing, you must, must have them. Number one, any innovation program must be disciplined. You're not out as a lone ranger, doing whatever you want, however you please. To be disciplined, you need to know how to get to the point where you provide value for the company and have, be able to get that to people and let them understand how you're getting there. Number two, you have to deliver value. If you can't measure the impact that you're having at some level, qualitative or quantitatively, why are you there? I ask that question to my team every day. Do you know why you're here? Do you know why you're getting paid? And if they can't answer the question, we haven't really done a good job of linking them to the rest of the company. So that's a very, very, very important. And really the third piece is about learning from failing. And everybody says learn fast, fail fast, blah, 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 blah. Well, what does that mean? The bottom line is you have to have a target. If you don't have a target, the old adage, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it, will be true. So once you have that target, you work your way towards it. How many people believe it's a straight line to a target? Uh, the answer is never. <laughs> Right? What does it look like? The answer is I don't know until I get there. But the key is the disciplined approach and having prepared, having have the right people, the right tools, and the right relationships allow us to work our way there. And that's really what the fundamental underpinnings are to really get things going. So anytime you get off track, ask yourself those three questions. If you're failing on them, you gotta make a correction, no matter what the environment is. Skip all that. So, this slide has been given all the way up to Randall Stevenson. Explains what the foundry does. Delivering value. We could stand and innovate all day long. We got lots of great ideas. If we can't make an impact on the market with our customers in some way, shape, or form, whether it's lowering an operating cost, making it easy for a call center representative to handle a problem, or actually coming up with a new product or service that our customers actually perceive. Take a look at that mission statement. When I saw it for the first time, I sat there and I said, oh, wow, <laughs> that's big, okay? How are you gonna transform culture? Are you gonna set the right example? Are people gonna look at you and say, can we do that? in our organization the way they do it without disrupting totally the way we do business. 
And I'm going to talk about how that evolution occurs and how you start from being a separate entity that everybody looks like as if you're in a, a fishbowl to being <laughs> everybody part of the same pond, is the way I describe it. So what do we do that's, I think, fundamentally very different than a lot of other innovation organizations that have been set up? Everybody always asks the question, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? Okay. So we focus in three areas. We have 280,000 employees. If we turn them loose on ideas for the company, that'd be great. So we did. We have 160,000 registered regular users on our internal website contrib contributing ideas for the company. Some that the foundry may or may not work on, but one of my roles is to take a look at those ideas, cull them, see if there's ones that the foundry can move forward quickly for the business, and then go back to that person and essentially make them a hero for coming up with that idea. The second is working with people like here at TechSquare Labs. Every year, somewhere between 250 and 400 startup and early stage companies, we build some form of a relationship with, whether it's just a one meeting, or one project, or maybe it's something that accelerates into the company. So I've met with quite a few companies over the year where I sit there across the table and I go, we gotta do something with this. Let's see if we can bake it, bring it to somebody, get by and get some wheels under it. Not an easy task, and I'll explain to you some of the issues that you run across and how you overcome them. The third piece, even probably more critical than everything else, is we have a tremendous support infrastructure around us. How many people in innovation have their own um, vendor management, purchase order, legal team? Probably none. I could pick up the phone right now and call a PR person that's assigned, person assigned from legal. I want a contract tomorrow and I see there's something we want to do, I can get a contract put together. And I don't have to pay for it, right? So I have the benefits of both sides. You know, the ability to go as a startup, but also the ability to leverage the knowledge and the wherewithal of the rest of the company, which is, you know, pretty nice when you wake up in the morning. But on the other hand, we're on the hook to deliver every day. I wake up in the morning and it's like, that's right, got to get something here tomorrow. If I don't deliver value every couple of months, I go, well, again, why are you guys here, All right? So, we run ourselves in sprints, kind of agile, but kind of not. Somebody says, how long does a project take? And what is it? Could be a week, could be six months, could be a platform that we're building that may take a year. It needs to go through evol evolutionary steps. But the fact that I can hold on to it for a year and get it to a point where I can hand it over to what we call our technology development team that runs operations and say, it's done. Please test it and deliver it. And they're like, great, we didn't have time to do that. That's pretty cool, okay? I'll tell, tell a quick little story kind of before I get into the stages and so forth. <coughs> Just so you get an idea of what happens day to day. About four years ago, phone rings. Hi, this is so-and-so. Hi, how are you today? This happens to be an officer in the company. What can I do for you? I have a problem. I have 100,000 call center people and they don't have access to a product. So it makes it very hard for them to sell. I said, okay, I'll call you back tomorrow, I'll let you know what we can do, click. As it turned out, that particular product we had had out in the developer program. When we looked at it, the question was, could we take something that we had done for developers working at home, to be able to see the product and add on to it, and actually give it to everybody in the call center? scalable, cost issues, all the standard things we're trying to ramp something up. So all of a sudden there was a small business person going, I made one for five people, can I make it for 100,000 people? And can I make a commitment tomorrow to somebody that's running the business? That's a pretty daunting task. The answer was yes, we did it. We put a complete program together. We actually ran the operations out of our lab. Why? It wasn't 24-7, you got a 15 nines, you know. It was, you gotta have it for due training. It's fine. We'll hire extra staff to watch it to make sure that it stays up. If there's a problem, call them. You got, you got a cell phone number. 
you have to put it into the big beast to deliver value. But the value of the company, to be able to do training, where no training was available, on new products that were going out, was incredible. And they couldn't believe that we could do it. You could not have gone to the standard operating people, the, the standard IT department said, I need a solution. They, they're not even involved in it. They've never even touched it. They would never even come up with the idea. So that was an adaptation of something we used internally that we then exposed to the wider operations group. Now, this chart, I'll have to explain it to you what this means. I came up with this. No, I've never shown this chart before, so I apologize if my definitions aren't perfect. But I tried to find a way to kind of codify the stages that you go through. The first stage when you are a new innovation center, you might as well be a startup and an orphan. You've got no home. Nobody will claim you. <laughs> Nobody knows what you are, what you can do, and so forth. So that's why I put the dotted line to the business as usual. Your objective is to get to this stage where you're tapped into the business at various corners of it. Start to build those relationships to where people start to understand, well, yeah, I should call those guys. You know? They know something about X, Y, Z, whatever it is, right? Ultimately, and that's, and I'll talk a bit about the DNA aspect in a second, why I call it DNA. And the last aspect is this change agent. Like anything else, once you become part of the ecosystem, you actually change it. You can look across and there's somebody that says, well, I've worked with them before and we can do it this way. And the next time the phone call comes, you're now working in concert, not separately. Right? They'll ask you to come to a piece. And I think one of the most uh, interesting conversations I had, um, I don't know, maybe two months ago, uh, anybody, everybody have a, like a central security office in their, you know, chief security officer and so forth? Are they the most loved people in your company? <laughs> no, okay. So somebody pretty high up in the chief security officer calls me, says, I hear you're working on this project. We gotta let you know you're not gonna do it. <laughs> I said, well, what's the matter? I, oh, we thought of this, we've done this, we've done it. So I said, okay. You're in charge, I'm, we're just here to help, right? That's always the answer, we're just here to help. I will never tell you what to do, okay? So he's getting through the end of the conversation, he turns around and he says, he says, you know, we got all this stuff we're doing and there's other stuff over here that we haven't got time to work on. If you guys could help us with that, that would be awesome. I mean, you're gonna call me with cool stuff to do that you can't do that'll help move the needle? Yeah, okay. Set up a meeting and let's go. Okay, so that interaction by itself and that credibility that was just transferred that we could help them and they would come to us. We'll talk a little bit more about that. That's the ultimate stage as you transition from the middle to the end. All right. So startup mode. <laughs> Six years ago, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I got to travel to California every other week to help build one of the first foundries in Palo Alto. So imagine yourself trying to develop credibility right in the middle of Silicon Valley and your AT&T. <laughs> they look at you and go, ha, ha, ha. So no, 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 we know what we're doing. So we actually made a conscious decision to not move into a nice, brandy new facility. We took one of the oldest buildings we had in town. We lived in a room with no heat, no hot water, moldy carpet, and tiles on the ceiling, just like a startup would. We just had a bigger bank account behind us, it was okay. Um, and we moved in there, and we sat on the floor for a while, and we went to Ikea, and we built our own furniture. How would you like to do that? Get a panel van, drove out to Ikea, built our own desks. The important thing is we were also trying to break our own culture, right, and start to think differently. So we went out and did that. The next thing, we started calling all the companies in the valley. Facebook, Google, come on over, see what we're doing. What are you guys doing? Come on over, come spend the day. So one of those days, I remember quite clearly, I had um, a CTO of a music company come in, sat on the floor together, and at the time we had a uh, U-verse was pretty in its early days. I said, what if we can make Pandora work on the TV? Wouldn't that be cool? He said, well, okay, let's see what you guys can do. 
one day, we built a prototype of that. You know what kind of credibility we developed with that, those folks down there? You know how many people they told that we could do stuff and it was different? It was amazing, absolutely amazing. So that was the first step. Second is internally, this friend or foe concept. And I th heard a little bit about it from Rock at the beginning. Oh, these guys are going to take my job. Oh, they're going to make me look bad. Well, you have to go with the right approach, right? So inviting people in to see what you're doing, getting feedback from them. I hold no project personal, even though I have a personal vested interest. When you come in and you look at something and you go, that's just not going to do it for us, I guess, well, we're on the wrong path. What, what do we need to change? And a lot of innovators have a lot of pride, right? I mean, you're working on that thing day and night. It's the best thing. It's mine, mine. It's really not yours, right? It's everybody's. So that's what you work from. This piece of prospecting. So if you've got a good pick and a shovel, you can go out and prospect anywhere, but you've got to know what you have in your pocket to work with. So when we go out and we talk to different parts of the company in the early stages, we actually, excuse me, I forgot to do one thing. <laughs> this never happens. Okay, you know, take care of that, sorry. Um, we actually go out and talk to people and say, I think we can do it. We went to the gaming community, we went to everybody and we said, we think we have something. And we're willing to invest. Cost you nothing to come play with us. Imagine that. Cost you nothing to come play with us. You came to us at one point and we said, I have money. Or even if you're a small company, I will fund you for a couple of months, pay for your resources. One of the challenges of a big company is you can crush a startup in about a heartbeat. Right? You can tie them up in process. Those legal bills will kill them. I've seen it many a time. So everything we do is with light weight and light touch, but total 100% respect for who we're working with, the knowledge of it. You come to me as a four-person company, it's going to be, okay, we'll find out what you're doing and we'll do all the work, and then if you, we find something of value, we'll put it together. We will not sit you in meetings and spin you around and you're up all night working on stuff for the next thing, for the next executive presentation to make me look good. Don't work that way. And I've seen it happen. I've been there. So let's move to the next stage real quick. Doing easy on time, let's see. So this is where is the, I call the make or break, establishing your DNA. What are you known for? When you talk to people, do you have a methodology that other people can follow that is reliable? Ours is very, very light. We basically sit down, we do a scoping document, we have some quick deliverables, and we cost it out if we don't have the resources to do it. And depending on where the value proposition is, as you might imagine, we might ask them to put some skin in the game, right? It's like any other business arrangement. Otherwise, everybody wants to come and say, wow, you got food in your refrigerator, let's eat. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. I see that you're, you shouldn't be so hungry. Maybe you should contribute, right? So this is a little bit of the back and forth where you, you build your relationships. One of the big things we have today, and it emerged from here, is getting a seat at the table. We asked our business partners in the different business units, we want to be in the planning sessions. Do you want to be, be in the middle of somebody's budget cycle, or you want to be afterwards, the next year, when they're, all their money is spent, it's all committed, and there's nothing to do innovation with? That would be bad. So getting ahead of the curve as they're doing planning for next year, as I say, we're always in the planning cycle. If you can't do it now, would you like to do it later? When would you like to do it? And is it still relevant to the business? Because things that are relevant today may not be relevant six months from now. The market moves and things change, right? I can't say enough about that building bridges. I can probably talk all day about that. Let's go to the last one. So where are we today? and how did we have to change? Because I can tell you the foundry is not the same as it was on day one as it is today. Driving concepts to support commercialization. If you are not willing to bleed with the thing that you put together, don't go. And what I mean by that is, you can't just hand it to somebody who says, it was great when I had it. You messed it up when I gave it to you, right? 
You have to follow it all the way through. And then you have to build mechanisms to follow it all the way through. So today we have staging environments where I can stage technology that's in a uh, interim operating environment, if you will, where maybe it's not got 24 by seven, maybe it's not got redundancy, so forth and so on, where it can have a scaled approach to do an entry point that's the least amount of pain for the business and the greatest ability to pick it up and move forward with it, or kill it. Because if something changes, now's the time to kill it before you've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars, whatever it is, right? Back to this business planning. If we do a program, and maybe I can use a small example without getting into trouble with the PR team. Um, let's say we've got a, a really big, important initiative for the company. In fact, I was out on one this morning. Uh, riding around with the guys on the trucks, out in the yards, looking at parts and supplies, asking why that was on that part shelf. I mean, crazy stuff that you would think, well, you're an innovation, what are you not doing with the parts in the field? When you spend 15 to 20 billion dollars on supplies, it's pretty big. If you can move the needle 10% in one direction or another, that's pretty big. So, you then have to build a program that's less about technology, more about science and thought process, and then apply the technology to help manage it. So that kind of a program where I have to actually hire people separately, dedicate them for long periods of time, that we're going to dig out a new piece of the business, that would be a commitment on an annual basis that the head of that organization would say, we need, back to my other chart where now we're inside the box with them, your expertise inside the business for a piece of time and we're going to absorb that funding, why we're going to get it back? 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 fold. In fact, in this case, I think 1,000 fold by the time we're done. So, and the last piece, I talked about it a couple of times in, in examples, but the trusted advisor, where you don't have to prospect, people call you and they go, could you look at this for us? Then you know you have made it all the way. And then the question is, what do you say no to, all right? So probably half the time, I have to say no. That does not fit either the resources or what I'll call the um, movement of the needle that's, that's important enough for, for us to work on. But once they find out you can do things quick, well, we got this problem over, can you do this first? No. It doesn't fit our model. You can have that done by so-and-so. And because I can answer the question and say you can have that done by so-and-so, that means I really understand how the business is running. And that's a big job, right? So I'm almost never locked up in my office. I am out on the field. I am out with people all the time. And that's just as important as actually doing the work, is understanding where it fits within the whole structure of the organization. And it changes. We bought Direct TV last year. Whew. A few changes there. But good stuff to work on. Lots of opportunity from an innovation center, right? So now they're one of my busy, biggest clients and the company try to help them move the needle, which is great. Good for me, good for the people on my team. And they're excited about it. If you wake up in the morning and you're not excited what you're doing in an innovation center, don't do it. If you're not, a fight, if you're, if you're not willing to take the bullet of when they tell you, we don't want it, don't do it. Right? Even if it's good and it might move the needle. Sometimes it's not the right time. We've been there several times. Great thing, awesome. Been to the board of the directors of the company and they said, go! And we were like, yeah! And then all of a sudden they're like, no! I'm like, oh, very painful. But what you take away from it is all the things you learn from it and you reapply it to everything. Every time when we get an easy one and I tell the people on the team, I said, did you see that? Did you know how that happened? Yeah, it was easy. I said, that's because you invested on the other end. You've been here before. That's why it's easy. Everybody else thinks it's hard. Don't tell them, okay? <laughs> Don't tell them, right? That's how you become the hero in innovation. When you show up and you solve because of all the blood, sweat, and tears you put in before, that's where you get your return on investment. It's no different than the stuff that you learn in business, but it's applied very carefully within the organization. We track our projects. I could, today I could go look up a project that somebody did in Israel, see what they're doing, learn from it, call and answer the phone. Can you all do that in your company? 
No, it's pretty hard. It's all locked down in some system. No, we purposely did that to be disciplined about where the projects are, who's working on them, what technology. I have a complete list of every company we've ever talked to. I could look it up and see the conversation. And it's probably close to 2,000 by now. You know how companies bounce around? I talk to him, oh, Reggie, we got great stuff. And he goes, nah, and then I go over and talk to Cindy, and she goes, well, maybe. And eventually, you hit the right person in the company, right? But you can't collectively pull that information together to find out where the hits and misses were to see how we can help and actually get a movement in the company. So we do that quite a bit as well. With that, I am just about out of talking time on the PowerPoints. I know you guys love PowerPoints. I, this is the only PowerPoint I've done in the last year, mind you. <laughs> so anyway, with that, let's open it up to questions. I'll be happy to answer what I can without getting fired. So, the floor is open. Yes, sir. This is that you uh, have uh, the premise of learning to fail mm -hmm. as one of the conditions for the thing. Do you track the rate of failure? Uh, what is that rate and what's known? So, then out of 15? Yeah, so let, yeah, I'll give you, give you a couple of metrics people always ask for. One is, you have, how, how many projects does it have to take to get a success? Yes, yeah, so the question is, what's the rate of failure? Okay, or I should say, what's the rate of success? It's the way I like to look at it, right? It's about one out of 10 across the board. One success out of 10? One out of 10. On a project basis, on the way to solving a particular project, who knows? You know, we try all sorts of things. I mean, it's very, very typical. And it depends on what it is. So in the early days of IP-based television, where nobody kind of knew what you could and what you couldn't do, we would sit there around the table, and we would develop a thing called the Dirty Dozen. It was never 12. I don't know why. We solved it a Dirty Dozen. But, but it made it feel good. We had a name for it. And we'd have a list of things. And we'd take volunteers. Who wants to try that to see if we can do it? And then some of the things were totally off the wall. But what it did was, by poking it and trying things, we learned a lot about the dynamics of the environment we were working in. And then, when we saw something that was really interesting, it would line up like, just like that. Okay? And one of those things that happened was back at, uh, let's say it was 2008-ish or 9, I don't remember the exact date. We were one of the first companies to put out a mobile TV app. Okay? One never existed. Now we take it for granted. Oh, no big deal. Somebody in the yard, this to that. Nobody done it. And we were sitting there, what would be great if the, and we had a list of ideas and finally we put the commitment to it. We built it in three months, showed it to one of the officers in the company that said, and here's where the danger comes. I never want to mention this. They always say, how much does it cost? When can I have it? Right? Those are the, those are the two killer words. And if you can't answer them, you shouldn't be in this game. Right? So I turned around. And I sat there. And I remember looking at Ralph De La Vega, for those of you that know Ralph. And I said, three months? You can have it. He goes, two. <laughs> I said, two. We want to beat so-and-so to market. So. That was a Christmas that uh, I forget, um, but but that's how you get in the game, right? You have sometimes you have to beat new areas up that you're, you're not comfortable with. You don't know what you're doing yet, but you will know what you're doing. Nobody shows up on day one know what they're doing. I don't believe it, right? But you find your way there, and we did have a very disciplined approach about calling the ideas and looking at different pieces of the technology so that we could learn going full scope left to right, whether it was UI stuff or back-end integration, all that. Next. Um, what role do you guys play in MMA? Do you play a part in the game? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, so when we work with startups, mainly it's in that, at that arena, uh, we do refer key projects back to supply chain and the strategy people, and then let them run with it, and they may ask us to do stuff. But kind of, I'll call it indirect, but we're closely aligned from that perspective. Uh, yes, sir. In your process, or just in general, mm -hmm. how did you gain access to customers and consumers? How did you get that permission? <sighs> 
and I'm glad you brought that up. Did I pay you beforehand? No? Okay. I'll use the I'll use the term. The, one of the other attributes that you have to really get good at is do no harm. Okay. To develop this trust level, and I'll, and I'll tell a quick story to kind of set it home. When I first arrived here in Atlanta, I was hired by Bell South to run their innovation lab. All 18 people, the strong. And I got there, and they had all this stuff they were working on. And I looked at it, and I said, wow, this stuff's incredible. What are you going to do with it? We don't know. I said, but you've got to give it to somebody, right? So I set about talking to the officers in the company. I said, this is great stuff. We should do something. They said, good, figure it out. I said, I have your support that if I need to call you, you know, like call a friend, or call for air cover, you know, because I don't want holes in me when I leave the building at night. So I walk into our network operations center and I explain to them I'm going to change our network. If you know anything about a regulated environment, the answer is not just no. <laughs> But do you want to die today? So um, I said, fine. I said, so let's do this. Bring all your key people in, and we'll sit in a room, and we'll talk about it. So I went into this room. I was surrounded. It was like, you know, Custer at the last stand. I'm sitting there, and they're telling me, no, 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 no. And I said, well, what's the problem? They said, you could break everything. And I was like, Mm, only going to have 50 people, but mm, and they kept going and going. So I said, I said, tell you what, you can put anybody on my team you want. You can tell us exactly how you want to do it, and the most important thing is, you can shut it down whenever you want if you don't like it. Imagine that. I let them shoot my project. So I had to almost say, you you can you can kill me if I do this wrong to build the trust. So what happened? They gave me a person. I had badge access to the centers. I sat down with the guys doing everything. Turns out they never turned it down. They said, this is great stuff. <laughs> I said, but it, you know, it's that gap, right, of not understanding what happened. And eventually, their people are telling everybody else this is great stuff, and we should do something with it, and it's not a problem. So then I had their support to do other projects. So you have to overcome that resistance by being able to build the relationships that way. That's all I can say. And it's different by situation. I've come across it multiple, multiple times, especially if you've got a very well-heeled operations organization that doesn't want anything done to it. Right? Don't touch it. Don't touch my toys. Don't touch my source code. Don't touch it. Okay? It's hard. Mm, let me try the back because I have been favoring the front. All the way in the back, straight down the middle. I know, uh, when, the, when the companies graduate into phase three into the enterprise, mm -hmm. how, how do you send the core team and the founders, so to speak, into the enterprise? How does that go? I didn't pay you either, did I? We didn't talk, we never met before. Good question. So, the way that happens. If you look at some of the announcements in the last couple of years, as an example, we came up with a new business unit for IoT. That business unit head said, wait a second, I need my own foundry dedicated to IoT. He took his checkbook out too, mind you. But, but, but that's the, the level that we reached in the company where some guy that's got a P&L going, I need my own piece to work on specific things and we launched that one out in Plano I guess it's got to be a couple of three years ago and that's a constant uh, how should I say it? accelerant to new business models going in they work very I mean that place to me is like amazing um, second and this is very recent uh, we got back into the medical side of the field we just opened the new center at uh, Medical Center in Houston, another partnership, because we believe that uh, tele various forms of telemedicine are going to emerge as a new business area. So that's generally where it happens uh, on a, you know, that next lift point where you're actually inside the business. The other piece is that, I'll call it ongoing project funding, you know, where they need you for a long period of time. And then when we're done, we move on to something else. So, uh, one more from the back before I come up here, Reggie. I know you're you're, you're doing good. Oh, the Delta lady in the back. Yeah. So, how are you measuring the quality of information? How do you measure that? How do we measure the? Culture of information. Wow. And then also, the hiring top tier talent is a part of the 
So I can tell you what we measure. Okay, culture is always a very tricky one. You know, how do you measure culture? Um, internally, just as a company, we measure uh, ENPS, Employee Net Promoter Score, just like we would do for customers. And we take that very, very seriously. So um, we measure the culture within our organization, the interaction with other organizations, and we score it. Is how else are you going to find out, you know, are you doing the wrong things? So we have that as, a, as a, one of the qualitative metrics. The other piece is, I think, the amount of projects we accelerate to commercialization is a metric to see how receptive the other side is, right? I could stand here all day with all the next 10 great things, but if they're not going to take them, it's not going anywhere, right? So the receptivity, you can, you can measure it there. Uh, that's certainly a, a, a valid mechanism. And those are the two I think that we hold the most dear. Because if the people aren't excited that are working for us and people don't want to work for us and then we're not making impact, it doesn't matter. Right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, over the years I think you've heard that content is key. What I'd like to know is uh, have you worked with any video content companies that are started? Through your organization, and if so, which ones have been successful? Wow, interesting question. So, um, do we work with new content companies? Yes. Um, do I directly a little bit? It's not a main focal point because content stuff is a very contractually oriented thing. It's less about technology and more about do you want to, you know, take this stuff to market, right? That said. One of the first foundry things that we did when we opened Palo Alto was we grabbed a bunch of um, media-based application companies that enhanced, I won't call it content from like a, watching a video, but it enhanced the, the information, the social aspects of finding content and sharing it. And we actually got them to market with our product in like 60 days. And I basically sat out there and said, we will get you to market. We want to see how you do with our customers. So that was a personal experience of doing that. But not, actually, not like a, you know, I'm doing the next uh, short film thing. That, that's not usually my stuff. We'll get to you, Richard. <laughs> That's one of those, it depends as well. So uh, um, it, when you have a big company the size of us, an incremental move is big because it has such volume, right? The, The chance of us doing a, a specific product that's big unto itself because of the amount of resources that would consume, less likely. Not, not impossible, but less likely. And if the mobile app thing was brand new at the time, we had a bunch of engineers on it, uh, I don't think we have more than a team of three or four is a pretty good sized team for us. That's a lot of people. Because once you start getting too many people involved, lots of process happens, the innovation level goes this way. For those of you who don't know, right? If I get four people in a room, I can't get the same answer on the same question. So good luck running an innovative pro project on it, right? Because everybody wants to go in different directions. So does that, that answer your question? I'm not sure. Yes, sir. What would you say was the most significant preconceived managerial bias you had? <sighs> preconceived. Uh, um. I don't think we really, we did such a good job at the executive, we didn't have any of that. We had more of a stopping long enough to understand how to work with us more than anything else. There was absolutely no resistance. I can tell you the internal communication and the support all the way up to the chairman was spectacular. And you really need that because for people to believe that it's the right thing to do and how to work, you have to have that. Otherwise, you are an orphan by yourself, defending yourself every day. We got, we got 10 minutes? 
Well, okay, we're, we're good. I'm building on that. What was, the, was there a breaking point that caused the ATD foundry and this initiative to be started? Because a lot of the time with companies, you'll see, like, you know, they think, oh, no, we don't need this yet. It's okay. Uh, You know, uh, since I wasn't there to light the match, but I was there as a nice dry piece of kindling, I'll tell the story from the kindling's perspective, okay? <laughs> right after the merger, a lot of people were trying to show what they had in the company that would be of value to it moving forward. Uh, one of our teams here in Atlanta did a complete showcase, because we had been doing innovation with Bell South for many years, and I, I, you know, I've been 30 years in this business one way or another, either as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. And we showcased all these things that we could do. And then we had a new CTO come in. And he came in to see what we did. And he had the vision. He said, you know this that they're doing? And what's going on here? We should do it on a bigger scale. That, that's the way I understand it from my perspective. Probably more to it than that. But the fact that many folks in our organization have actually sat with the chairman, talked about their projects, presented to the board of directors, that's a big deal, right? You gotta be doing something right, and it's gotta be important for the company to be doing that. So, that's the level of visibility. Otherwise, change doesn't occur. It's, it's, it's just, um, how should I say it? You're just talking about it, but you're not doing it. Right? Yes, Reggie. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to pick on you. Besides your personality, why did they choose you? <laughs> You know, I ask myself that question every day when I wake up. What did I do to deserve this? Um, why did they choose me? Um, I basically, I come, to, I come with all this energy every day. This isn't just here for you guys, okay? Anybody that knows me has met me, work with me. I push the envelope, okay? I don't want to come to work if I can't. I don't want to come to work if I can't see things happen, so. I think that that just naturally occurs, right? It's always come to me. I haven't gone, had to go to it. That's why I was brought here in the first place. That's why I've stuck around. They go, hey, you got all these years. Get what he's still doing there. I'm like, I'm still having a good time, right? I could go anywhere. I could do anything that I want to do, but I choose to stay here and do this. So that, and that's really what makes it exciting. And it's been, I can't tell you, this group is just raising my energy level like tenfold today because this is the stuff I've been talking about in Atlanta. I've met so many great people over the years, the guys from Earthlink years ago. I mean, I could go name down, down, down the list. It's been a hotbed, but it just hasn't, had, just hasn't come together and gone, mm, and now I think it's happening. So. What is the first step in entering uh, and talking to the boundary as far as this project? Oh, you want to talk? You want to talk to me afterwards? Is that right? <laughs> Small unmarked bills in a white envelope. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, um, we actually have a person on our team that's head of outreach. Generally speaking, if somebody calls me, because obviously we're quite social and in demand, I will send them to our outreach person that has an awareness of what we're working on and what we're looking for, and they will talk to them and do a little bit of, I'll call it polite vetting, right? And then it'll be brought up at our meetings and we'll say, hey, oh, you got somebody that does that? I want to talk to them. Okay. And sometimes it just happens organically. I mean, there's no, you know, yeah, very light on process. But it better be good. Okay. Yes, sir. How do you handle it, collaboration, kind of open innovation, from external and external, internal, with the IP? Very carefully. Especially with a small company. In a big company, it's a little easier because you know, you've been through IP stuff before, where it's not a, a whole training exercise. Um, it really depends on the pro. Go ahead. Well, I can get an NDA turned around in a day. That's how I move quickly. I get, an, I get it under NDA so we can talk. And then if I have something that's a proposal that's worth having, I can get that to legal and, and to supply chain in another day. I mean, I can literally launch a project in a week if I want to. Yes, in the orange. How I can't. Did you get to that point? What was that? Say that. I'm sorry. How did I get to? You mentioned initially that you had your own legal team or sourcing team. How did you get there? How did we get there? From the point in your evolution, were you able to get there? From the beginning. So. 
From the beginning, we asked for certain resources just to get us off the ground, because you can imagine anybody we wanted to do work with that was external, especially in the Valley. If we didn't have legal with us, we would have been, uh, it would have been very, very hard. I think the big changes for us have been with supply chain and finance, because finance, well, they can be your friend, or <laughs> they can ask questions that there's no way you can answer because you're not on a P&L, right? So it's a different funding for an innovation organization, and that's really one of the questions you have to ask internally, right? Because the finance people are trying to understand investment in capital, expense, headcount, all the different things that you might be measuring internally, and, and you don't want that to disrupt what you're doing. So that's a constant, I'll say, re-education in some regards, depending on what you're changing, right? So I, if I am make a for instance, let's say you're gonna staff up for something that's gonna go on for two years. That's gotta tie into somebody else's budget, there's a lot of complications, you may need to buy infrastructure, all sorts of things. I mean, I had a, lab for a while that could serve 300,000 video com customers. I could have gone into business by myself. <coughs> and I had to build it to be able to test the things that we were proposing to go out to our customers. That was a huge capital investment that I had. If I didn't have the supply chain people and I didn't have the finance connections, no way. Not gonna happen. Okay. Was that innovation a separate business unit? And if so, what's the ROI you guys are on? So we report into the chief technology officer, as you might imagine. For a while, we reported directly into him, which was interesting, because it comes out of his budget, right? That makes sense. Um, no ROI direct metrics. Every year, the metrics move depending on what we think is appropriate for the business for us to instigate change. And I'll give an example. About 18 months ago, there were large corporate announcements that we were gonna get very, very heavily into this thing called Domain 2, which is software-defined networks, virtual, ev virtualize everything, right? To lower the costs in the business, so forth and so on. Well, who would, who would you want to lead to go into that new area that <laughs> the company's not been in before? Oh, that would be us. What do we know about that area? A mm, little bit, but not a lot, and we need to start investing, right? So we became, a future investment piece that they put seed funding in to do that and assign people to do that. But that was done at a very conscious corporate planning level asking us to make a change and pick up other things as part of our domain and we measure that. Our efficiency and quality. <sighs> efficiency is good. Quality is hard to, to put a finger on since we don't we don't have a way to measure that. Right, unless I put something out to the market. I can look at acceleration, how quickly I got it there, and, and, and I'll give a prime example. We had a music thing going on in the fall where they needed some help. For those of you that uh, know about transcoding, you can do it on hardware, you can do it on software. We built a containerized software methodology of transcoding in a month, and we launched it two months later, and it's still working. Okay, gets everybody pretty excited that you can do that. The ta talent to do that was not in other parts of the company, but because we were in this virtualized environment, we knew how to do that, and nobody else did. Right, so we got on the track for a little while, I said, here, look. And they go, oh, I well, didn't know you could do that. Well, here you go. It took more time in testing for them to figure out how it worked than it did for us to build it. I was saying in terms of when you think, when you think of a project, yeah. approach, it's time, quality, you know, investment, cash. So you guys actually have the time and quality in terms of the uh, We, I'd say we have, we, we, if the quality of work that we do is not meet a high bar, we're out of business. I mean, it's just, it just comes with the job. I mean, Imagine. I mean, a disappointed customer for me, if that got out in the company and started having a chaining effect, that would be awful. It's not gonna happen. It just, that part of my job is to not, to never let that happen. Okay, well thank you.